Hey everyone, you know, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you about HTMX. It's one of those technologies that just makes Python better. And we're gonna talk about why that is. Let me go ahead and just start by sharing my screen here. There we go. And pulling this up. Fantastic, okay. So you may have heard of HTMX. It's a JavaScript framework, but what's cool about HTMX is it's not about writing JavaScript. If you were doing Vue or Angular or React, this is the idea you're gonna take and put a lot of the logic of your application in the front end in JavaScript. And honestly, that's a large reason why things like Node.js have become so popular because, well, if you're already doing most of your work in JavaScript, why don't you just finish it off and do the server side in JavaScript as well? And HTMX allows us to say, no, we like Python. Can we please do code in Python and Flask or Django or Fast API or whatever it is that you want to use? For our talk and our presentations here, I'm using Flask, but that doesn't, it's not because HTMX is tied to Flask. It's just something popular, a web framework in Python that people know uh, that will be easy for us to sort of share examples in, okay? One other thing I want to point out as we get started here, like this is not anti JavaScript. This is so much as it is really just enabling to say you can use whatever language you want without the need to switch context from the server side to the front end, to the server side of the front end, to the server side of the front end, back and forth through a bunch of APIs. So if you really loved JavaScript, this would make that better too. This would allow you to write just server-side JavaScript. Right? But of course, we're going to do Python. And why is it important that you don't have to do this context switching? Well, what you're allowed to do on the browser and what you have access to, like, say, the database directly, is different than what you have access to on the server-side. So it allows us to do two really important things. Add interactivity as if we were doing you know, something like Vue or Angular, but without having to switch out of the context of being on the server. All right, so very, very nice technology. I think you all are gonna love it. We're gonna write some code during the session and you're gonna see it in action. It might be a little bit surprising. It might be actually simpler than you imagined, okay? So let's start by talking about HTMX and then we're going to get over to Python. So let's go over here to htmx.org. Now, HTMX is a framework that brings AJAX and CSS transitions over, as well as WebSockets and server set events. We're not going to worry about the WebSocket stuff. We're really a, just about this right here. Okay. And one thing that's really awesome is it lets us write in pure attributes. We don't do declarative, we don't do imperative program. We do declarative program. We just say, we want this thing to happen and it's up to HTMX to make it work. So part of the motivation of this library is really to try to fill out what HTML should have been. So um, Carson Gross, the guy who created it, adds a few questions for us to think about as we go here. He says, why should we only allow a tags and forms to be the things that you know, links and forms to be the things that make requests. What if I clicked on an image? Couldn't it do some kind of HTML or HTTP thing? Why should click and submit be the only things to trigger them? Like what about a key up event, for example, as I'm doing a search? And then uh, why should get and post be the only methods available? And finally, why should you only replace your whole screen, right? Uh, you can click a link that'll replace the screen. You can submit a form that'll replace the screen by reloading the page. But could I just fill out like a drop down box, right? All these things are totally something you would expect from, you know, like a, a rich front end framework. But why doesn't HTML itself just have that? So the idea is HTMX is supposed to sort of leverage the, the ethos, the core ideas of HTML itself and just make it better. So let's go over here and actually look 
at an example before we get started here. So there's a whole bunch of examples that you can check out and I encourage you to go explore them. These basically summarize a lot of the features that you're able to do uh, with HTMX. So let's see, we have something like infinite scroll and each of these examples have like, here's how much code you have to write. By the way, that's all of the code. How's that for a pretty sweet and short bit of code to write? So here you can see the stuff is here. And if I go quick enough, you'll see there's a little spinny thing and then there's more, there's a little you know thinking, thinking image and so on. And let's go back up. So you can check out that one. The one that we're going to focus on here is this one called Active Search. Okay, so in our example, we're going to do some fun stuff with Active Search. So down here, it shows you the, the code that you're going to need. Again, that's all of it right there as far as the HTMX side. So we can come down here and we can type um, MI and you get this. Notice it fills out that section. What about CA? There's cash and what about Simon? There's the Simon. Okay, so you can just see as we type, there's a little thinking for a second and then this bottom part appears. Super, super cool. Now, how does this work? Let's go and look at what I think is one of the simpler uh, examples here. Let's see, value select, this is the one. So if I've got two uh, select or, or combo box type things and I select one, it might need me to select a different set. So imagine we're doing like a car sale site here and it says, well, you wanna buy a car. Well, first of all, what manufacturer is it? All right, so is it made by Audi or Toyota or BMW? And then the list down here, right? A1, three and six, these are Audi cars, all right? Well, if I wanna change this to Toyota, I would want that to change, right? So check this out, I click Toyota and now it's all here, all right? I click BMW, go back to Toyota, and I can pick these. So it's cool to see it in action, but did you notice the little gray thing at the bottom that says server request three and show? So there's this cool debug thing at the bottom to help you understand. Now it says, here's the initial state. Let's go back up to the top where it describes this a little bit. It says, what we need to do is we're gonna have our select box that we're interacting with. Remember picking Audi, Toyota, or BMW. And then there's another select box down here that we want to have this, this one, this models one, fill up with the results of the models of the selected one from above. So um, we've got, a couple of settings you can see htmx get says we want to go do a get against models slash models on the server where do we want to put the result not here not in this section we want to put the result of that request as the inner html of that basically and then this is just the spinny thing that goes right there okay so with that in mind when we click here when we click the first one we want to do a get against models it does make equals Toyota. And then this was the HTML response, not JavaScript, not JSON, not some other thing that we then process and then turn over. No, we just take whatever the server generated, right? When we do this request in Python, in our example, it will go theoretically to the database or something and generate this result and say, here is a fragment of HTML that represents the result. And it's just gonna jam that <laughs> into here like so. When we did BMW, we got that back and so on. So this is really the, the Zen, the idea of HTML. How, how do we go and basically set up little things on the server that allow us to without any effort on our part, map actions like a select event here over to the server that will generate a part of HTML. The declarative nature of HTMX tells us where it goes and when those triggers happen. And then we just put that in here and you can see super cool stuff like this right here. All right, let's go back over here to the slides for just a sec. So that's this framework, that's how it works. You probably have heard about 
the LAMP stack. Maybe you've heard about the mean stack. But with HTMX, they talk about the HOWL stack, which is a fun acronym, right? The HOWL stack is about hypertext, HTML, on whatever language or framework you want. So the idea is you set up this little bit of JavaScript and HTML, and then it's up to you on the server. And when it comes to servers, guess what? You have a lot of choice. It still drives me crazy that the browsers only implement JavaScript and WebAssembly, but mostly just JavaScript. So you don't really get much choice. But if you can move it to the server, then you can choose whatever language you want. Most importantly for us, Python. Here's another interesting thing to consider about whether HTMX is useful and where it fits and how it compares and contrasts against what came before it or alternatives. When I spoke about, I, I tweeted about this idea of Flask and HTMX, I thought about how cool it was and uh, just how much cleaner the code was. And somebody tweeted back to me, this is the text of the tweet, and said, I'm super excited about Flask and HTMX, but outside of it just being a little more clean, is there anything I'm gaining? Well, you don't have to write JavaScript, you get to stay on the server side. Here's what they sent back. I said, well, but... I kind of, I could do that now. Look, if I just write this, this thing on the left here. So if I go to the search form input and I hook a function into key up, and then on that, I grab the value, by the way, you have to remember to understand this correctly, which is always crazy. Anyway, so I, I get the text out and then I can do this Ajax call to a URL slash suggestions, a get, and I pass over the data text. And then on success, I'm going to get an HTML response and replace it just like we've been talking about. See right there, that's the, isn't that basically HTMX? I mean, is there any real reason to use it over just JavaScript? Well, let me show you the code for HTMX compared to this. Is it the same? No, <laughs> no, it is not even close to the same. This is what we write to accomplish the same thing above, right? How do we how do we do it? We say we want to if somebody types something, key up. We want to go somewhere, suggestions, and we want to put the fragment in something which is a CSS selector. So place for suggestions. Cool, right? I would way rather write the code in the little gray box at the bottom than the stuff that I screenshotted off of um, Twitter or wherever I got that. So check out the examples. There's a bunch that I think will apply to you. What we're going to do, I already mentioned this, and so we're going to focus on active search. We're going to use this library that I called Video Collector. I've sort of extracted it from a course that I wrote, and it's a Flask-based web app, and it has the ability to search through these videos. We'll see it in just a second, but basically it, it collects videos, as the name might say. And here's a search box. So this, just looking at it, looks totally... Normal, I could come in here and type thing, something, I press enter, I get search results. That would be like form, action equals post, standard Flask stuff. But there's a couple of things that I want to change. First, in this section, as you type, I want it to come up with results instantly. I don't want you to have to wait and type out something and hit enter, go no results. Oh, let me try something else, right? Like maybe the right search result would be Indy Space Car. Not in this case, but it could have been, right? And, and if you typed IndyCar and pressed enter, like, no, there's nothing. But maybe you type, as you're typing Indy, you see, oh, there's the results. Also, notice at the top, this URL here. One thing that is not great about a lot of these sort of form style interactions is you can't link to them, right? If you link to the page, you just get the bare form, not the data you filled into it. So here we've got this ability to have the results up here that we search for, but also this is going to show up in our browser history which is pretty cool we can bookmark it we can go backwards and forwards we can refresh it things like that so that is the goal of this presentation and basically take a regular form that searches this video thing and use htmx to add active search to it okay all right let's let's get over there and build something huh let's put this away first of all i have this app running here in uh, PyCharm down below. Let's just look around it before we get to the code or anything. Okay, so 
This is your favorite videos, old school Yahoo style. Why do I say that? Well, remember what Yahoo was? It was basically a catalog of things. Like you would go to the Apple category and here are all the Apple videos. Pretty cool. We can see our videos here. Uh, maybe I want a different set of videos. Let's go over to racing. And here's some stuff about racing. And these are videos that we can actually go watch. Like for example, this guy in Australia, Will, made this insane video where he built this sim racer or some of these things like this and this are actually part of, they're actually part of his world. And the other part is actually some crazy simulator. Anyway, maybe it's a cool video. You wanna keep it, right? So that's what this app is about. It has the ability of us to go down here and add a video. It also has infinite scroll. So for example, if you scroll down here, you can see it going like along with thinking. By the way, the thinking we have to add in, like it's, it's too fast, you would not actually see any infinite scrolling. And the part that we're interested in here is this search for the search a video, search the site. Right now, this is a traditional server side page and it just has a form, it submits it, does a post, the results come back. But let's go ahead and do that anyway. So I had IndyCar on the screen before. Notice I'm typing, nothing has happened until I press enter now, and then we have our results. Or I could come over here and type boosted to see that one I was telling you about. You could see about Apple, or of course you can see about Python, right? So it works, works great actually, but if I try to link to it and I come over here and I load up that page, well, that's not amazing. And if I try to refresh it, I get this scary warning like, oh my gosh, we're going to resubmit the form. The page you're looking for used information that you entered. Returning to that page might cause an action you took to be repeated, like you might have buy something twice. Do you want to continue? No, I definitely don't want to do that. That's, that's crazy. So let's get out of there. We can do better and in lots of ways with HTMX. So let's go fire up PyCharm here and get going. All right, now, first of all, how have I installed HTMX? Is there like a complex CLI webpack type thing? Let me show you. This is the installation bit here. Down on the bottom, this is the install step. So to install HTMX, you include it in your page. Couldn't be simpler, right? Standard JavaScript, super small. Um, this is about 10, 10K. And this is not necessary here, obviously, but I put there just in case it changed the version, it's caching and so on. So just put this, you're good to go. So now every single page is already active and ready to be programmed or extended with this idea of HTMX. So let's real quick look at just the structure of this app so you all can kind of follow along. We've got some models. This represents like videos and categories. That's straightforward. That's like database type stuff. We've got our views. Like for example, here's the video views. This is our search view that we were talking about. It goes to video slash search. It creates the form empty upon get and it will do your search and return the results on post and it goes to this page right there now i'm using this idea of view models if you're not familiar with this such a nice way to separate sort of the mapping and conversions and validation between html pages especially forms but also other things and html um, and, and the python server-side code and then sort of keeping those in sync okay so over here, let's go to that real quick. It has something to sort of pull the search text out of um, some kind of request potentially. So if you were to try to link to it, it would, it would get that. It has some videos. These are the videos that are the search results. And if there's search text, it'll go to this database thing and return the results. And we get database objects. Those land over here in this thing. where we have our form that we submit, and then the results, those videos that come back, we just loop over them and we have a little bit of structure that puts them right there.
Okay, so this is all standard traditional Flask, no HTMX yet. All right, now how can we enhance this to use HTMX? It turns out it's incredibly simple and you've already seen this a couple of times, but let's just go through it, okay? So we have HX and these are all the commands. I would love for some sort of autocomplete, but you know, whatever, you get what you get. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an HX-get and this is going to be equal to, well, let's just go ahead and go to the same page. We already have that working. Let me do that. When is this going to happen? Like on what scenario? This is no longer about having a search button here. I'm going to take away the search button. So what is going to make the search happen? Well, hx dash trigger is going to be key up. If we just leave it like this, it will work, but it will replace our form with the results. We don't want that. We want the results to go down into this section that says, here's where the search results go. It's an ID, so the CSS selector is hash search results. So we just say hx dash target equals hash that. Okay. Now, this looks like it might do it, but let's go back here and see. So watch if I, first of all, let's get a, a fresh version. Uh, if I go over here and I type, I typed A, look, 28 results, P, P, L, E. Something's happening, but what in the world is this? Like, why is it inception? Well, remember what happens. Over here, when this trigger runs, key up, it's going to go here and say, give me the HTML fragment, and we're going to jam it into this section down here. Well, what is the fragment? The fragment is, like, if you do a request against this, you get the whole page. <laughs> so what it did is it just took the whole page, and it jammed it down into this section. And I probably could make it even, even worse if I went down here and type, <laughs> you know, I could probably get, like, uh, results to go in there. Anyway, Wapple. Wapple is not what I was hoping for. Anyway, crazy, crazy stuff. So... What are we gonna do? I will show you the wrong way to do it and then a better way to do it. Now, not the wrong way, the, the suboptimal way. So one way to do this would be say, well, the problem is this method returns everything, right? So let's not, rather than debug, let's duplicate. Let's duplicate this and call it search results. And it's gonna have um, a different HTML page that is a fragment of HTML here. And I like to have this organization of, I have my full HTML, and then I have these little fragments that I call partials, so partials. So I'll put it down, I'll create this file down here. Okay, so let's go down here, file new, not Python, HTML. Does it look like this? Uh, it looks like this. Is this what we want? No, that's a whole page. We want a fragment, so delete all that junk. And what do we want? We want this bit about here that we're actually rendering this all out. So copy just this section that we had in here just for the results and put that here. Okay, super straightforward. Now notice this is a Jinja file. It's going to take videos as a parameter piece of data that it needs. And that's all it needs. So it needs videos. This is a, an important step here. And let's go back to this. And this is actually going to supply it with videos. So that will that'll work. And last thing to do is change this to search results. Unless I typed something wrong, we might have this working. Let's give it a try. You ready? So let's go over here and type for WWDC. Oh yes, look at that. Already. Already we have it working. This is it. We're done. We're done. I mean, we can improve it, but this is basically it. Apple, Python, right? Check that out. Pretty cool, huh? But notice as I type, it might be hard to see over Zoom, but this is like a, a flicker, 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 because that was seven, seven server side <laughs> requests. And notice as I move my mouse even, or my, my uh, cursor in the selection, even that's rendering it. 
even though the text hasn't changed. So let's quick fix that up over here. We could say, cool, there's a trigger, but we only want to run the trigger when it's changed. So that will still uh, do stuff if I type Python, but now my arrow keys no longer go crazy. And the other one is delay, uh, let's say 500 milliseconds. So as I'm going click, 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 typing, don't hit the server. Instead, wait a second. So let's go over here. Now I can type Python stop oh, and get the results. I can type WWDC stop, get the results. And that delay, we can adjust it's 300 milliseconds, 400, 500. What is the right one? I don't know. But you can see that this is, this is actually pretty much it. This is active search on our site done. But, but we do want to do a little bit more with this. We also want to have some kind of history up here. Notice if I refresh the page, it doesn't warn us anymore because we've never submitted a form. But also if we get the link up here and we had something and we hit Apple, um, <laughs> still in a form, hold on. If we go over here and type Apple and I link back to it, it's gone, right? So that's not ideal. The other thing notice, it was a little weird if I hit enter because it's in a form. We don't actually need this form anymore. Right? This was the old school way. Y'all don't want that anymore. Okay. So it should still work. We go over here, refresh, Python. Still works, no form, but my hitting enter doesn't do weird stuff to it. So that's cool as well. Hopefully you all are loving this. It's really neat. It's really clean. I mean really clean. That is so fantastic. That feels to me way better than going, you know what, I'm going to stop working in Python and I'm just going to start writing in Vue.js and write little view components or whatever it is that you're off to do, right? So this is super neat. But there's a couple of things that are not ideal. First of all, we don't have our, our um, history. We don't have our link. That might sound complicated. Let me implement it here in just a second. So you can go and say, I would like your intermediate operations to result in stuff going to the, uh, the basically the address bar and the history. So there you go. That Those two features are now implemented. That's pretty awesome. Let's go over here, pull this back up. Notice the slash search. Let's search for Apple. Oh, see it over the top. Let's search for WWDC. Let's search for Python. If I go over to my browser history, will it show me? See at the bottom down here, look right in this area. It's hard to, but you can see. That's awesome. What if I click one? Oh, what is that? Well, those are WWTC results. <laughs> but, but why do they look like this? What is going on? I remember I told you this was suboptimal. This going away from search, having this other view that is going to allow us to see uh, basically not worry about uh, returning the whole page but returning this fragment okay yeah that is suboptimal to be honest and now how do i even get back to the site like i go back over here and i gotta remember it's like this so let's let's go back and say you know what that was fun that was cool michael but maybe this isn't the right solution here it could have been the right solution if we didn't want to do the history thing, right? It was okay. You'll see it's not necessary, but it would have been okay. But with the history thing, it's clearly a bad idea. So let's let's go back and go here. And what we're going to do, not that one, this one. And we're going to say we're going back to the same URL as we were going to before. Now, you could say we could do a post against it and you know if it's a post it's a htmx thing and if it's a get it's not that's maybe a fair assumption i'm not really a big fan of that there's a better way to do it so let's go over here and make this work where we don't return the whole page jammed into the search results so that brings us to our little view model ideas over here the view models are all about each each view each page has its own view model. So there's a search view model. We already saw this, but you may have noticed there's a base class. And in the base class, this is the stuff like 
always having access to the requests, having this request dictionary that is like a combination of um, URL values, um, post values, a form values, um, headers, cookies. So you just go to that place and go, give me the data. I don't care if it came from a cookie or from the URL, stuff like that. And so on. And one of the things we can do is just say, teach basically all of our, our site, all of the things that use these view models to understand, is this an HTML, a direct request or an HTMX request? So we'll have a variable is HTMX request, name it whatever you want, it's your variable. But the thing is, notice my little comment appears that I didn't misspell capitalization or anything like that, is if this, if there's a key in the, uh, the headers, uh, in the headers, it doesn't really matter what the value is. If that key is present, that is your flag, that is your indicator that this is coming from HTMX as a partial page request, not as a full web browser page request. So that lets us go over here and write very nice code. We just say this, if vm dot is HTMX request, that's what we just wrote. HTML is going to be not the whole thing, but flash dot render template. This is going to be slash videos spelled correctly. Uh, partials search results dot HTML. And remember this thing needed video. So, so we could just say videos or because we have this dictionary thing, we could just say, um, I'll do it like this. I'll say videos equals VM dot videos. Keep it simple. And that's not quite enough to work with. So what we're going to say is response. Let's just do this return flask dot make response from that HTML done. So now when a request comes in, it says, oops, don't run that a request comes in. It says, all right, let's see, is it a HTMX response? And we return that partial bit of HTML. That's this one. But if it's a full page, just return the full page, right? Full request. So let's try this. Go over here again, see if we broke it in one. We have not broken it. Yes. So it still works. This is the HTMX path. The first one was, let me get rid of this for a second. This is the, the full page, right? So that is when we're coming through like this, just return the entire page. And then when I start typing, if I type something meaningful, I get results here. Nice, right? Notice up here in the top, I've got this link. If I go to a new page and I hit enter, it's going to work like, uh, oh no, oh. Why did that happen? <sighs> Just can't win, can you? You cannot win. Check this out. Here's what happened. So over here, remember, I copied this chunk of HTML out of here. And I pasted it over here because we need to do this partial request. We need to go and grab this fragment with the videos and generate it. What I could do to fix this is I could copy this. I could jam it in there and watch this. If I do that, this works. I don't know about you, but I don't feel super about having this big complicated bit of HTML here and here, okay? I'm not digging that, so I'm not doing this. Now, there are different ways in Jinja, the Jinja template language, to put fragments of HTML in different places. There's include and there's macro. Neither of these work especially well in a general sort of solution. I could actually use include here and I would think it would work just fine because the thing that this has has a set called videos and the thing, the thing that would be included wants some videos, All right? So there are ways to sort of include this natively. But let me introduce you to a package that you may have seen hanging out in my tab up here called Jinja Partials. So Jinja Partials basically adds functions in the way that you know them in programming to Jinja templates, all right? So the idea is that, I've seen this, I stole the sample from here from my little open source project, is you go in and you run this line of code in your app.py or wherever your startup code is, and then you can just call render partial 
pass along the data that you need. Okay, so for example, here we're saying for V and videos, I want to put something into this block using this section, and I want it thinks it needs a thing called video, but in the loop variable I called it V, so we're going to pass that over and so on. Now, sometimes people see this and they say, well, isn't that just like include? No. If you really want to see all the details, click over here. There's like a great long discussion of it. You can check that out. Not worth going into. But what is worth doing is noticing that I've already included that right there. So by doing so, I can now use this partial idea on any template in the site. In particular, let's go do this. So down here, I remember I wanted that fragment of HTML. I don't want to have code duplication. I want to possibly transform the variables, et cetera, et cetera. So in Jinja, the way we output um, either structured HTML or text, the return value of this partial thing says basically this is safe HTML. So because it's effectively another Jinja template. So we just come down here and say render partial our shell like this and remember what we had up here we had this flask render template same thing so we just copy paste except for we don't have a, a vm we just have video variables and that's it that is going to take all the code that is in here and pass it some bit of data that we've come up with here and, and put it in so let's just try this again now we're gonna be really close Okay, so close this. Go back here. All right, this looks good. Let's type something. Let's type um, IndyCar. And let's type M1. And let's type Python. Go back over here and copy. I'll copy this. If I go and hit Enter, what are we going to get? The results. Exactly right there. This part at the bottom is the render partial that happened right there. It's taken this and it filled this section up with this code. And then if I go back and I type, and I type um, sim, it's gone and replaced what appeared in the original page with that partial request back to the server and just dropped it out. And now it's just doing a direct render on this section, okay? We end up with such incredibly clean code here. Um, it's just amazing. I mean, look, let's look just for a second. I'll put this as full screen as I can for you. This is the entire implementation. Let me just tighten this up so you can kind of see it here. That's it. That's the entire implementation of what we've done. We've got our HTMX, we've got our history. We've got our deep linking, the ability to link into it and, and render it directly. And we've got this sort of function in HTML that means there's no duplication. So we change it once, it's always gonna be in sync and changed. If that doesn't impress you, I, I just don't know what, what else will, because this to me is just mind blowing. How much functionality is happening on this page and how little code we've had to write to do it. You might say, well, it's all happening on the server side. Sort of, I mean, like, it's true we did add this. Like, that's the whole server-side implementation, those five lines right there. So combine this plus that HTML, I mean, amazing, just amazing. Let me go back and see how much time. I got a few minutes left. Let me just show you a few more things that I think are pretty neat. So we've, we've been on this search page here and we've been having it work. By the way, just one final thing, I guess, is let's go over here and just double click this, see these results other than the responsive design basically making it look bigger it this is working right okay let's look real quick over here two other things we talked about infinite scroll right you saw that there's this infinite scroll here let's go look at how we pulled that off we have i think that's called feed so over here check this out that is our infinite scroll Render partial, show the first three, page equals one. And then the partials is just each video in the list. For each video that came in that fragment, put it on there. And if we have more videos, 
put this HTMX tag at the end that when you reveal it, the trigger is you scroll down to reveal this HTML element, go get the next page. Here's your indicator that you're busy. That's it. That's our infinite scroll implementation. All of it. What was the other one that we did? Oh, I haven't shown you. The other one is uh, if we go over here, uh, not there, we go here to a category. Let's go, we want to add another Python one. Notice we could add a video here. And if I had a link to type in, I don't have anything to type. I could type it in and just inline, it would add another video. So notice just boom, this little form just fades in. You add in one of these videos. That's how all these other ones got here. Type that in, hit create, boom, it just adds dynamically. Once again, not super hard at all. It's, you got it's under videos, no. videos category. So that whole section is the show is partial thing. This is it. We have a question in the Slido. Yeah, yeah, about, let's let's do it. Yeah, asking if HTMX is mature enough at this point to replace JavaScript alternatives entirely. It's a good question. I think I would say yes for two reasons. One, it's doing so little, right? It's doing so little. Um, so in terms of us, like a stability answer, I would say certainly I think it is stable. This is actually. Um, a follow on to something called intercooler JS is like the reimagining of that. So it's kind of based on something that's been around for a while that Carson Gross created. Now, the one area you might, you might wonder about is, I think it comes down to for the app that you're building, is there, is there a way to do all of the interactions that you need, right? You know, like you would never try to create, never is a strong word. I would, it would be unlikely you would try to create something like Google Maps with this. Could you create Gmail? I'm pretty sure you could create Gmail, but I don't know that you could create um, like something more interactive like Google Maps. So for a limited set of front end framework candidates, yes. With the web sockets plus all the sort of cool interactions, I'm pretty sure you could do Gmail. But the other area that you want to consider is this doesn't have any offline support at all. So, for example, progressive web apps are out. Like that's that's just a thing that you can't do because it is intended to entirely depend upon the server. So if you know progressive web apps need like a a non-server type thing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, one more question. I guess sure. the code available for demo, I think someone actually posted into the Slack channel. Maybe it was a different, oh, that was your class. You had a course about something. Yeah. So, HTMX. yeah, absolutely. So I was going to mention that as well. So if, if you go to talk Python, um, HTMX, which is that talk Python.fm slash HTMX, this takes you to the course. Hey, I have a course in this. If you want to check, take it, you're welcome to, but uh, more relevant for everyone. I appreciate if you take the course, but uh, is the source code. So over here, this is open. I thought about creating a separate GitHub repo, but I'm like, this literally just has the same code in it. So yeah. So I'm just gonna refer you to this. If you go to the code, go to chapter six, here's where I started the presentation. Here's where I basically ended the presentation. So so you can just go in here and have a look around. It's You can see it's like literally awesome. what you would expect to be, um, be in here, okay? All right. Couple more questions. I think we got sure. time to fit them in. Is it possible right. to handle errors coming from form requests? Error handling is a little bit funky because if you're like submitting it, it just comes back as an HTML fragment. So what do you do? I have not played with it a lot, but there is a way in HTMX to deal with errors. Yeah. Um, and then I think there's, there's, some, there's something about there. Yeah. Like asking about how you mentioned the size of the HTMX JavaScript library being like 10K. Hmm. Uh, do you anticipate that creeping up in size, kind of like React has over time? Not anywhere to the degree, because it's so limited in scope. I do expect it'll grow, but yeah. it's been 10K for two years or something, so I suspect it'll... Pretty stable. Yeah, I mean, it may have gone from like 10.1 to 10.3, but not like 10 to 100, nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs>